take a bit, but um, Bob is now in, uh, at my firm and uh, making a great contribution. Uh, as, a, as a longtime friend and acquaintance of the congressman, uh, I've, I've asked Bob to, uh, to introduce him and uh, give you some insights into, into uh, 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 Congressman Wahlberg's uh, background. So uh, Bob, would you do that please? I mean, when you're a dinosaur, the, the, the introductions go back further and further, so. <laughs> Seriously a minute, uh, I've been privileged to work with this industry for many, many years, and I've seen it evolve, and we've had giants in the Congress, like a John Dingle, for example, who basically had the vision to bring us all together and to help form this, this grid system that we're talking about today. We've got a, noob a newbie on the block, uh, a fellow that I've known for a long time, going back to the time he was in the Michigan legislature. But he is someone who became a, a politician because he was a man of faith. And he believed that he could make a contribution and was open like some of the previous heroes on behalf of the industry, to learning all about us. So what, one of the reasons I wanted to introduce him to you was because I felt that if we're talking about the next generation of leadership in the Congress, we have a responsibility to articulate our concerns. And what I can tell you about Tim Wahlberg, he listens. So it's really a privilege to introduce Tim to you and I hope it's the beginning of a really very good relationship between him and, and this industry. Tim? Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Well, to lay any concerns, you know, he mentioned that, uh, that I'm a man of faith. I was a pastor, pastor for uh, 10 years before going to the dark side in politics. Uh, I was also in high school and college a wrestler and a boxer, but I promise any questions asked today, I won't body slam anybody. <laughs> That's all I've been asked about in the three interviews this morning, starting out, would you body slam? No, no, no. Uh, I won't do that. So it's good to be here with you. A, a, truly a newbie on the committee. This is my first uh, term on, uh, on energy and commerce. Most people, three tries is the charm. Took me four tries to go to energy and commerce, and uh, delighted to be there. Uh, Michigan Seventh District is uh, arguably the energy district in the state of Michigan, with Consumers Energy and DTE and all the power plants that we have there. We we produce about 30 percent of all of the energy produced in Michigan is produced in in Michigan's uh, Seventh District, uh, with all of the above. And uh, I think that's the direction that I certainly want to promote an all of the above energy plan using a grid that is constantly upgraded, developed, resourced, and produced to make sure that that happens. Um, we have nuclear, we have coal, we have natural gas, we have wind, we have solar, uh, all sorts of stuff, plus the corn growing, uh, producing some of the power, uh, and the garbage uh, that is producing some of the power opportunities that, uh, that add to the infrastructure of energy across Michigan uh, and other states surrounding us as well. So today I was, I was asked just to bring you a little update uh, as, as a person who's intent on understanding what's going on in energy, specifically related, related to the infrastructure and the grid uh, from the perspective of Energy and Commerce Committee. To just give a little thumbnail sketch, uh, looking at the near term, uh, it's an all of above plan that we're looking at. Uh, sitting on a, the subcommittee on energy with uh, Fred Upton as our chairman who understands uh, from a long time process of indeed sitting under the tutelage in many ways of John Dingle, learning much from him and then chairing the full committee for his six years and now uh, uh, chairing that subcommittee. Fred and our subcommittee as well as the committee is committed to finding an all of the above plan that works that allows expansion that reduces uh, bar uh, barriers to expansion and opportunities, improving the existing infrastructure, but realizing that existing infrastructure has some age on it. Uh, 
And how do we develop the, the tools, the resources, and yes, the funding that moves that forward? Medium term, we're looking at uh, a Department of Energy comprehensive review and, and authorization plan and looking at a fishing efficiency standards review. This is the time to do that. Uh, everything that was old is new again. Uh, and uh, all of the new that's in place right now has some uncertainty that allows us to establish parameters. The long term, uh, looking at electricity system and power markets review, uh, looking at pr uh, promotion of technological innovation and new digital information technologies. It's interesting being out in the Silicon Valley a week and a half ago with our Education Workforce Committee looking at some of the new economy, gig economy, sharing economy, all of that's digital that's going on out there. You've got to have a grid. You've got to have infrastructure to achieve that. Uh, and it's amazing the creativity and the solutions that are just waiting to happen uh, with the creativity and mindset that, that's there. Um, uh, looking at uh, uh, the ability to uh, kind of push back to some degree uh, on the aggressive environmental regulations, mandates, tax policies, distorting federal uh, competitive markets. And we have plenty of that and we have plenty of inertia uh, that we have to push back on in, the, in our long-term look and long-term solutions. We're also looking at the implications of state generation choices uh, on, uh, on interstate commerce, uh, competition, and consumers. But probably more interest is looking at the crystal ball. I've talked with Mac to try to find out where the crystal ball is actually housed on Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, uh, Mac, we haven't found it yet, have we? Uh, so I'm going to make it up as I go here. Uh, just from kind of talking around and under t trying to get some understanding on what energy and commerce infrastructure bill that we'll be looking at is going to be. Energy and commerce is currently developing an infrastructure package. Um, the timeline for working on it, I'm told, is in June. Now I've told other, been told other timelines for working on other major projects, and generally it may start there, but it ex expands. But June is the beginning of the markup, I'm told, on a, uh, uh, a infrastructure package. Uh, as the committee uh, process continues, it's imperative that we hear from you. Now, I'm sure you hear that from politicians in the past. And I see some indications of skepticism about that. <laughs> well, make me a liar. Let's hear from you. I got in touch with my uh, chairman of education workforce two weeks ago. Had a round table looking at issues relative to joint employer, fiduciary, uh, etc. Workforce issues. I chair the workforce subcommittee on, on help. Uh, health, uh, and, uh, employment, labor, and pensions. And I looked out at the assembled group, uh, group of uh, uh, special interest, all with a great amount of knowledge in those areas, as I've developed and chairing subcommittees in the last six years on those issues. And I said, I appreciate you coming to this, this round table. We want to hear from you today. But when we call for you and call to your association, and say we want someone to testify in front of us from the real, real world, no offense, Bob, we don't want attorneys necessarily. We'll take the attorneys, but more so we want people that are practitioners in the field. <laughs> and I got a literal elbow on the side from my chairman saying, quit preaching. Well, I think we want to hear that. Um, we're ready to hear from you. We'd like to take real world ideas, concerns, issues, uh, to the committee, and I'm a freshman. I don't know that we can't do that, or we can. So I'm asking you today, uh, sincerely, give us, give us your ideas. So we atta uh, tackle the, uh, the challenges with the appropriate issues, ideas in hand. The committee is also looking at ways uh, to develop and maintain a viable energy workforce uh, so that we have uh, skilled labor that's necessary to maintain uh, what's necessary in developing the infrastructure for years to come. I'm pleased to say I've seen some of that as a result of Consumers Energy, DTE, in my district developing actual training sites at community colleges, 
freestanding uh, training centers uh, that are talking to junior hires and high school students even saying if you want a true job that goes on in the future that will pay dividends immediately if you don't mind working outside you don't mind working long hours you don't mind working sometimes in in dangerous situations that give a lot of excitement we will train you and we'll further train you beyond that and if you see this is something you want to expand on we'll train you into engineering fields we'll send you to university and college if necessary but we need people trained in these in these areas so um, from what I found in just the few months that I've been on that committee and the several years of having uh, tutelage coming from places like Consumers Energy and DTE uh, the utility companies are investing over a hundred billion dollars each year in critical infrastructure to make the US electric grid smarter more innovative resilient and efficient and reliable we know that and we need to make sure that uh, our citizens understand that and that's the privilege of doing town halls on these issues in my district and talking about what's taking place we also know that money will not tackle the issue on its own but it sure can be helpful uh, it's it's crucial that Congress meet industry investment with practical cost-effective public policies that bring a more sensible approach to what is traditionally an onerous federal uh, permitting process uh, so that's something we need to do to make sure that care is taken but done efficiently uh, the key is finding a happy medium uh, between the environmental concerns and I think we can I majored in forestry and land management I don't take a back seat to anybody on environmental concerns but I also understand that we enjoy the environment much more if we also have a good economy and we have all the tools that ne are necessary to make our life and our living our employment opportunity greater and I think we're doing a pretty good job in the process of achieving environmental we just need to make sure that our per permitting process follows suit as well so refor reforming federal regulations removing red tape stream streamlining the permitting process and coordinating multi-agency reviews will help not only spur industry investment but also help maximize its use um, in addition to reducing regulatory and permitting relief uh, it's very important that Congress also focus on energy workforce development as I as I mentioned to you just last week we uh, had the opportunity in the Education Workforce Committee that I've been given a waiver to stay on uh, where we unanimously uh, approved uh, HR 2353 the strengthening uh, career and technical education for the 21st Century Act uh, in that bill uh, it was key to promote uh, education for real-world jobs in the area of infrastructure specifically energy infrastructure and technology that goes there uh, we wanted to make it opportune for people uh, to receive training by moving back a great deal of decision-making back to where the jobs are so that we can have community colleges uh, we can have uh, career and technical training centers we can have um, apprenticeship programs uh, in the industry as well as in the private sector or the government sector capable of having dollars as well as the opportunity to use those dollars to train students uh, in the careers that you're, you're interested in as well that passed I'm delighted to see that it was unanimous effort uh, it's it's a bipartisan I, I believe a bipartisan issue to make sure that we have a career force that are trained to take on the jobs that are there for us let me just mention a couple other initiatives that I've been personally involved with uh, before opening up for any questions you might have or comments um, sent a letter not too long ago um, to the president encouraging him to prioritize the appointing of commissioners uh, so FERC could have a forum, forum and right now I'm glad to say that maybe even as we're meeting here uh, that there are two FERC appointees uh, Neil Chatterjee and Robert Paulson who are um, before the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee um, today looking at confirmation opportunities so we need to move that forward I know in my district in my state there are projects right now being held up because we don't have a quorum on FERC 
and that's a uh, necessity. Also, uh, H.R. 1109 uh, amends the Federal Power Act to include a minimum monetary threshold of FERC uh, review of acquisitions of facilities that fall under FERC's jurisdictions. Uh, there was a drafting error, error, error in the 2005 EPA Act, uh, and uh, it basically said that they could uh, uh, give oversight uh, into uh, projects that, were, that had zero cost. Uh, just opened it all up with no, no, uh, no uh, uh, limit or minimum standard. This bill go, will go a long way in uh, dealing with that problem. Having said all of that, I've exhausted all of my knowledge about the field, <laughs> and hopefully the questions won't go beyond that. Um, let me ask a question to sort of kick things off. Um, thank you very much for, for giving us at least uh, a, a basic a timeline for infrastructure legislation, sort of at least how it begins. Uh, and we certainly hope that transmission infrastructure is one of the components of, of a bill like that. We had a really good panel just before you got here, Congressman, that uh, 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 dealt with workforce issues, cybersecurity issues, a lot of different things. One thing I'd, I'd love to ask you about is what kind of priority do you think um, cybersecurity and physical security of the grid uh, will receive in the committee as it deliberates uh, on infrastructure? I think it's going to receive some significant um, concerns. Cyber, yesterday, in fact, we had a, um, a, a, a uh, roundtable looking at that whole issue um, and discussing the processes that are already in place for training people and preparing them with tabletop um, problems, real-world situations relative to cyber attacks uh, on the grid and how communities are being prepped and prepared to handle that. I think that gives a good indication from our committee uh, our interest, seeing what's going on in a uh, crazy world right now and the capabilities of shutting us down, uh, really degrading all of our military capabilities along with it, of having grid shut down, uh, forces us into that situation. So, no, I think that'll be a major part of it. We had also, we had, also had uh, um, um, a, a brief film and a, some observations on workforce issues, um, which is something we don't talk about nearly enough. I'm sure you're aware that uh, as much as 60% of the workforce uh, in the electric utility and natural gas industries uh, will, those workers will be leaving uh, either for retirement or to go to other industries in the next decade. Um, uh, you, you, you had some suggestions about how uh, Congress can help with that. Certainly community colleges, union training programs, that kind of thing is, is important. Is that, is that an issue uh, that you feel the committee can deal with? Uh, since one of the, one of the reasons uh, that workforce tends to decline is the decline in the number of big projects in the pipeline. Uh, not to mix my metaphors, yeah, but yeah. Uh, we're, we're talking about electric transmission and how to get it built, um, uh, getting those projects uh, into, uh, into the real world yeah. and, and on, the, on the ground is really an important issue. It, it, well, the Education Committee is certainly uh, moving that direction. Last year we were successful, as you know, or many of you know, we passed uh, WAIA, the Skills Act which really devolved federal government from many of the career training programs and pushed those back to the states and pushed in a good way of saying that's where the training ought to take place and that's where the dollars ought to be on the ground to meet those training needs. We gave a great amount of latitude for the states to come up with their own solutions, the community colleges, the various trade training areas, 
I think of Jackson Area Manufacturing Association in my, my district that's doing a great job in developing that, plus some of your apprenticeship union and otherwise apprenticeship programs uh, to let the emphasis reside back in the states and the local communities. Uh, we know, you know my, in my industry with, uh, uh, with uh, the, the various um, um, uh, energy companies, they have those training plans in place. They're frustrated times of running across mandates that come from the federal government in the past. We reduced that. Speaking with the new Secretary of Education, she is firmly committed to implementing WOIA as we intended it and as President Obama signed it that took the strings off and many of the mandates off from the federal level. The other issue is um, the fact that for too long we gave the impression that every student needed to go to a four-year college or university. I mean, I think we all agree that the, every student needs continuing, in fact, lifelong education. I certainly need that. Uh, but they don't need necessarily to go to a four-year college university. And so to release dollars and programs and authority to start to build up those trades training. I, I, yesterday I had uh, a group of underground contractors in my office. And they said the same thing you did, that one of the biggest problems is that, number one, we haven't trained people or pushed them to that field, saying that is a sweet spot for many of you. You don't have to go to university or college for your program. You don't have to take on a student loan debt. In fact, you may come out of these programs without a debt at all. And in fact, there may be an organization or a company that pays you to go through that. But also the point of view was that um, We've got to get parents to understand that these jobs are there. These are jobs that are needed. Secondly, if we grow an economy where we have these projects in place, and this is what the underground contractors are saying, we lost a lot of people simply because we aren't building them. We weren't doing infrastructure. So they went other places. They found jobs in other industries. And now it's going to be hard to lure them back. We've got to overturn that. And that's, uh, that's a consistent process that we have to undertake. And I think we've started it in Congress recognizing those in a bipartisan way and moving it forward and uh, it will help your industry as well. Well, thank you. Well, on behalf of WIRES and uh, the National Electric Manufacturers Association and EESI and the Gridwise Alliance, thank you so much for being here. We we'll hope to see you again. Thank you and I hope to see you and uh, thanks for the job you do.